The views, comments, and opinions of the following program do not necessarily reflect those of Morris Media Studios, MorrisMediaLive.com, or its affiliates. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings to you from uh, Los Angeles, California. It is good to be with you today. Uh, I am Reverend Calvin Sauls, and we want to welcome you today uh, to Faith Without Borders. Looking forward to uh, an exciting conversation. Um, And, um, of course, as we gather today, we uh, want to remember all of our um, migrant sisters and brothers who are crossing borders all around the world. You may have seen the news uh, that 150 uh, migrants from Libya uh, perished as they tried to cross the Mediterranean uh, to get to Europe. Uh, And so today we're going to be checking in on um, black migrants on the U.S. southern border. We don't hear too much about uh, what's happening with our sisters and brothers Um, in Tijuana and other cities uh, in Mexico, uh, as well as even, you know, in Texas, you know, uh, so Tijuana, Laredo, Texas, and other cities where uh, migrants are coming from across the African continent, but also from Haiti. And so uh, today we want to explore uh, that conversation and that issue uh, from a thought-provoking and solutions-oriented perspective. We also want to let you know that this will be part one of several segments uh, on this particular topic. And so we are uh, grateful uh, that we are able to do this and just shine a spotlight uh, on this. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, the organization that uh, I co-founded, uh, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, has been doing some extensive work Uh, not just around being uh, on the board and being present there, doing some advocacy work, some strategic and critical advocacy work there. Uh, They've been joined by another uh, ally of ours, uh, the Haitian Bridge Alliance. Uh, And um, uh, and then also we've done several other um, trips to Tijuana with uh, uh, other allies, um, uh, Clues, uh, Black and Brown, Clergy, uh, collective, and we're going to have a guest uh, from there. Uh, I'll introduce him, you know, in a few minutes. Uh, we've also worked with some of our um, uh, labor allies, uh, SEIU uh, 2015, uh, right here in Los Angeles. Um, we have taken constant caravans and convoys down uh, to Tijuana. We've been joined by faith leaders, uh, activists, uh, advocates and so many people uh, who want to respond with compassion to this humanitarian crisis uh, that I believe uh, is a moral crisis. Um, And so uh, we also want to acknowledge the International Society of Black Latinos. They are in Tijuana today uh, doing some work with uh, some of our um, black migrants there and um, uh, just looking at what the needs are, serving uh, they are there with uh, some uh, lawyers to see what can be done uh, in terms of uh, the status uh, of our sisters and brothers. Uh, they've gone down with supplies. They've bought supplies in Tijuana to serve and share with uh, uh, people there. So we, we, we're grateful for all of these organizations uh, as we come together to deal with this challenge on so many different levels um, and, and, and looking forward to see how we can continue to advocate uh, on the one hand, uh, for uh, just uh, immigration uh, uh, transition here in the United States, uh, but also uh, deal with some of the other challenges that this administration uh, uh, seek to engage in, such as, uh, of course, adjusting the asylum laws that makes it more difficult even for people to seek asylum 
in the United States. So this is a multidimensional uh, and a, a, a complex challenge for us, and therefore uh, it requires, it invites, it demands a very, very intentional and comprehensive response uh, from all of us, uh, people of compassion, people of faith, people of uh, goodwill, uh, humanitarians, but most of all human beings seeking to respond to this crisis uh, from uh, a perspective uh, of lifting up people's humanity uh, and their dignity. Not too long ago, uh, the LA Progressive uh, put out an article uh, and there's been several articles uh, on uh, the presence of blacks on the U.S. southern border. Newsweek uh, did a, a piece on it a, a month or so ago. The Washington Post uh, did the uh, same thing. But I'm going to reference the, uh, the L.A. Progressive because uh, we work with uh, our editors there. They are allies with us, and, and they're doing a, a, a tremendous work, Dick and Kyle, um, and so uh, uh, really excited about, you know, what, uh, what Sharon and Dick are doing, you know, uh, on uh, the work through the L.A. Progressive, you know, in terms of media. And uh, in this article, they quote uh, the uh, executive director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, uh, my dear sister Nana. And I want to just lift up uh, some of what um, was part of a report that the Black Alliance for Just Immigration published around the black presence uh, at the border, just to give us some perspective uh, for our conversation and to uh, shed some light on the, the crisis uh, on the border. Um, uh, and so they wrote uh, the following. According to a report uh, from the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, uh, the face of migration is changing. People from the Caribbean are the largest group of migrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border, other than migrants from Central America and Mexico. Uh, Baji notes the uh, 7.0 magnitude earthquake that hit Haiti in 2010, leaving 300,000 people injured and as many as 316,000 dead, was a leading cause of the migration of Haitians. Nearly 7,000 Uh, Haitian immigrants live in a number of uh, Mexican border towns, and 19,000 African and Haitian uh, migrants arrived in Mexico in 2016, uh, and up to 700 a day were arriving uh, in Tapachula, Mexico, uh, in that same year. Last year, over 3,000 Haitians went to Tijuana, Mexico, in the hopes of making it to the U.S. Many stayed and formed a community there uh, after facing a protracted asylum process. Facing pressure uh, to reduce the flow of migrants into the U.S. and threats from uh, Donald Trump um, to impose tariffs on its imports, Mexico returned 81 migrants to Haiti in June after several attempted uh, to flee Uh, the uh, airplane during an uprising at the airport in the southern state of Chiapas. Also that month in Chiapas, uh, home to the largest detention facility in Mexico, hundreds of Haitian and African migrants rose up and attempted to flee their harsh conditions, and we've read so many reports and seen some images about that. Black people detained in Mexico have complained of of abuse uh, from the guards, Uh, lack of food uh, and medical care, and cramped living conditions uh, in which 50 people sleep in rooms only 9 feet by 12 feet. So this is, of course, a humanitarian crisis, a moral crisis in general, uh, but today we want to focus specifically on what's going on around uh, blacks at the border, African and Haitian you know, uh, migrants uh, who are currently, you know, uh, at the border. I'm so uh, appreciative uh, of uh, Pastor Q Jean-Marie, a friend and brother of mine, uh, who's able to join us by phone today uh, to discuss this. Uh, pastor Q is the uh, pastor of Church Without Walls uh, in Skid Row here in Los Angeles, and I'll, I'm going to ask him to say, tell us a little bit about uh, his ministry there. But he's also uh, one of our uh, 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 catalytic leaders in the city, convening uh, uh, clergy 
um, uh, in a, uh, a collective and collaborative that we call the Black and Brown Clergy uh, Collective, and he'll share a little bit about that uh, and the work that we've done uh, together. Um, not just that, but uh, just all of the uh, uh, work that uh, that he's involved in uh, as it relates to uh, the lives of black people right here in Los Angeles, uh, as well as around the state and indeed around the country. Pastor Q, uh, are you there? Welcome to Faith Without Borders. Yes, my brother, thank you for having me. Um, yes, I am here. Yes, thank you so much for uh, joining me. Uh, I know you got a lot going on, uh, as we all do, uh, but uh, so uh, glad that you uh, took some time. Uh, before we get into what's happening at the, uh, at the border, I always invite our guests to just to say a little bit about uh, what, you know, what some of the work you know, uh, and ministry they are involved in. So can you tell us just a little bit about you know, uh, what's happening you know, uh, 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 at the row, uh, in Skid Row, your ministry there? And then also a little bit about, you know, uh, this collective that we are all a part of, you know, called uh, the Black and Brown Clergy uh, uh, Collaborative. So, uh, Pastor Q, just a little bit about, you know, uh, what you're up to and appreciate you with me being uh, what we call ourselves black immigrants, you know, uh, right here in Los Angeles. Again, uh, thanks for having me. Yes, I am uh, Pastor Q. I pastor the church. With our walls in Skid Row, we've been past, been pastoring there for 13 years. In August, on August 8th, coming up pretty quickly, will be 13 years since we've been on the streets of Skid Row. We have service every Friday night, and we feed people every week. So you can imagine the investment uh, in the past, man, 13 years every Friday, and of course, special events and different things that we're doing. I also uh, work with uh, Clergy and Laity United for Economic Justice, uh, also known as CLUE, uh, and we do a lot of work with unions. We partner with unions, do a lot of work. CLUE was actually started with some labor partners along with um, Reverend Lawson, and so, um, and inspired by the uh, Memphis bus boycott, uh, I mean sanitation uh, workers, um, boycott and, and, and strike and all that stuff. Um, you know about all that stuff, so I don't really want to go into that. Mm -hmm. But um, here in Los Angeles, uh, Skid Row, one thing I would like to say is that when it comes to black folks, anywhere that we are, oftentimes we are hidden uh, because uh, by design the system hides us. And so Skid Row is predominantly a black community. I can talk about that all day, and we don't have that much time. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a lot of black folks here in Skid Row. And one of the things we like to say about homelessness as it relates not just to Skid Row, but all around the nation, homelessness is a racial justice mm -hmm. issue. Absolutely. And um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to that one. Uh, we had a, uh, a show on that a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Q, and so we, we're doing these you know, uh, in parts. Uh, and we had Janet Kelly and several other colleagues of ours that we all work together around the homeless uh, challenge. And certainly, you know, uh, as one of the commissioners, uh, we continue our work together, uh, our work together that we did on uh, the, um, the affordable housing challenges. And uh, I had a great time being down there uh, with our folk uh, at the Church Without Walls. Uh, when uh, uh, when we worked on that together, and and that that continues. I know before we close, I'm going to ask you to make an announcement about uh, some uh, social enterprises work that you are doing there, you know, uh, with our folk. But we cannot, you know, run away from looking at these challenges from a racial equity perspective because that is key for us in terms of just the uh, the historic structural you know, schemes and systems that's been put in place that continue uh, to just paralyze our folk uh, from, you know, uh, living uh, their, their full potential out and becoming, uh, uh, as we would say, what God has intended for them to be. Life to the fullest uh, continues to be uh, a, a challenge for so many, including our migrants uh, that we are uh, dealing with on, on the border. Um, I have to say uh, that just as Reverend James Lawson was the co-founder of Clue, Reverend Phil Lawson 
joined me in being the co-founder for the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. So, so we're grateful for all these connections and intersections, you know, uh, taking place uh, of uh, prophetic leaders who seek to be about uh, uh, the social gospel uh, and a gospel of liberation and transformation. Um, and so we're grateful that we are able to stand on their shoulders uh, and work and walk with them, you know, towards a just uh, a more just and fair society. Uh, I, I appreciate your friendship and partnership and leadership, Pastor Q. I know the two of us uh, joined together uh, one early Saturday morning, 4 a.m. We met downtown Los Angeles at the offices of uh, SEIU 2015 uh, to prepare ourselves to be part of a convoy of about eight buses, I believe, uh, heading down for all-day work you know, uh, in Tijuana with uh, uh, our migrants there. And, of course, our focus uh, was to connect with our black migrants there, to to check on them, to see about them, uh, and to uh, continue our work around advocacy, you know, uh, for them. Uh, Let's let's start with that, and, um, and maybe you can, you know, just share a little bit about you know, your observations, uh, your perspective. I know when we got there, you uh, went to another site. I stayed, you know, uh, at the Baptist church that hosted us uh, where we uh, did some work. Uh, and so um, uh, it, it was uh, an extraordinary experience. But your perspective, Pastor Q, in terms of what you've observed there and uh, just your thoughts uh, around the uh, experience and the situation, you know, uh, in Tijuana as it relates to our black migrants. Yes, um, and the partnership was with uh, SCIU 721. Mm -hmm. Um, That was the the group that works with us in terms of of the black and brown clergy and community coalition. Mm -hmm. So we went down uh, and we had actually several buses, like you've already uh, indicated, and it was an experience because trying to get stuff, buses full of stuff, by the way, a lot of uh, supplies that we had to unload once we got to San Diego, put them in different buses because, they, you know, you can't just drive one bus from uh, Los Angeles all the way into uh, Tijuana. There are buses that are designated to go there. Uh, and then we had to, once we got to the border, we had to take all that stuff out again at the border, and <laughs> you remember, uh, and then put that stuff back in after we checked. So it yeah. was a long, tedious process, and that's one of the reasons the Mexican government, uh, actually the Mexican government, uh, don't want that stuff in because they would rather you bring in uh, money, right? And so that's one of the reasons we believe they are uh, so hard on, on folks trying to bring stuff across the board. Mm-hmm. Uh, that said, uh, one of the things we struggle with here in Los Angeles is the idea of what an immigrant is, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And we went as the black and brown. Specifically, we chose the church that we did. There was a church there in, there's a church there in in, uh, Tijuana that took in 150 migrant families um, and um, uh, from Haiti. And so we wanted to stop at that church. They uh, they they told us about a church in San Diego, but we specifically wanted to go to a church where there were um, black migrants as well. So we went for the, the caravan that was coming from Central America a few months ago, um, and then we saw people in, I mean, conditions, sleeping on concrete floors, um, very in that, in the, the Central American caravan, a uh, few, very few uh, black migrants uh, we can we can see very few black migrants there, but um, you were there actually at the church mm-hmm. uh, with the black migrants that were there, and even uh, then we had some minor difficulties as it relates to how um, you know those providing services were relating to different migrants, and so these are some of the things we try to overcome uh, and mitigate as we are trying to show the face of immigration and it's not just what the rhetoric that you hear it's not just folks coming from mexico it's not just folks coming from central america it's a lot of folks coming from africa and uh for some reason um folks don't don't show you that picture yeah you're right about that um uh, while we were you know at the church uh, uh clearly you know we <clears throat> there was some um uh, language injustice uh because 
Uh, our Haitian sisters and brothers certainly speaks either Cre- they speak either Creole uh, or uh, uh, French, uh, and so we had some um, uh, some language you know injustice and had to deal with some interpretation uh, pieces. Uh, and then I mean the situation is so desperate, um, um, and and because so many times you know uh, black people are pushed into invisibility, moved into the shadows, uh, we observe certainly you know uh, uh, some of that. Uh, even though we try to intervene, you know, uh, in it, but but certainly colorism, you know, uh, plays a huge uh, role all around the world uh, as we see the awakening again and advancement uh, of of white supremacy, you know, around the world, uh, and it happens, you know, uh, everywhere, even in the Americas, you know, uh, around that, and so uh, clearly what we observe was, you know, if you. Um, regardless of your status, you know, if you if you light skin, you uh, you all right, you know. Uh, however, if your skin is black, you got to get to the back. Uh, and so, uh, several of us who were there, you know, uh, intervened, you know, uh, in that. Uh, and it all started, I think, with making sure that there's language justice. And, and sometimes we don't, you know, uh, pay attention to, you know, how language sometimes can be used uh, as a form you know, uh, um, of discrimination and dehumanization uh, around that. There were certainly several Haitian families there, you know, uh, at uh, that uh, church uh, living there and being taken care of, you know, uh, by the church uh, and supported by the church. Uh, And then we also had the opportunity uh, to, you know, uh, have some conversations, you know, uh, with them as well as uh, listening to them in terms of their stories, you know, uh, uh, sometimes that's a key piece of just humanizing a person is just to uh, uh, is just to be there with them and to uh, have that what I call ministry of of transformative presence with them uh, around that. Later on, we were able to you know connect um, with the some of the leaders of that uh, community uh, as soon as the. Uh, Haitian Breach Alliance, you know, came on campus as well as the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. They were able to join us in the afternoon, you know, just for some strategic conversations uh, around, you know, uh, what are some of the the physical, financial, legal barriers uh, that they are facing, even educational barriers that uh, they are facing, seeing that they are basically, you know, uh, caught in limbo uh, there in uh, Tijuana, and how they're really seeking to make meaning out of what's happening with them. I, I have to say, uh, these are not folk who arrive there on vacation, for vacation. You know, uh, uh, these are folk, you know, looking to better their lives, uh, the lives of their children, and to give them, you know, a, a future uh, and to provide some sense of stability, you know, uh, for a folk while they are there. So they're looking for all kinds of ways of empowerment you know, uh, as they uh, find themselves, you know, uh, right there. But certainly there was a disparity uh, as to the um, uh, the treatment, you know, uh, of folk that we've heard. Um, uh, however, uh, while we were there, uh, Pastor Q and our delegation, you know, we worked very, very hard to facilitate, you know, uh, uh, equity in terms of, you know, how we, we spend, we spend, we spend uh, time with, you know, people. Uh, the other thing that was very, very powerful about our time over there was we had a large contingent of faith leaders. Uh, bishop Mendez was there with us. I believe we had a bishop from the uh, um, the Anglican Church, you know, here in Southern uh, California. Uh, but y- just a huge contingent of multiracial uh, and multireligious, you know, uh, individuals uh, that uh, that were there. Certainly, we are driven. You know, by the fact that, you know, um, uh, this uh, Jesus who was of color, who was black, was one, you know, who was a, um, a migrant and, uh, and, and certainly, you know, uh, under, understand, you know, what's happening, you know, around this. So, so given that and our presence there, Pastor Q, you know, um, what is your um, uh, uh, impetus, you know, from a faith perspective? In being engaged, you know, with sisters and brothers, you know, on the margins, you know, whether it's uh, what's happening around homelessness in southern, in, in, in Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles, in Skid Row, 
all in terms of what's happening, you know, uh, with migrants on on the border. Uh, just this, you know, local and global phenomenon of displacement, if you will, you know, uh, of people for so many, you know, uh, reasons. You know, uh, what's the impetus uh, uh, for you in terms of why it is essential and and critical for us, you know, as people in general, but especially people of faith, to be aware of this and to see how we can, you know, influence and impact what's happening you know, with our sisters and brothers who are experiencing displacement from around the world, uh, as well as uh, right here in Los Angeles. Well, Jesus said, um, you know, or Paul said rather, uh, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and what is it to be Christ? What is it to, to live and, 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 and to be Christ? Well, in every, it means he said, "I would li- I rather be with Christ, no matter what, right? So if I live, I'm gonna, I'm gonna project Christ, and if I die, I'm gonna be with Christ." And so uh, he shows us what it's like. He said, "I have a strong desire to be with Christ," and he showed us what it's like to be with Christ. The woman at the well showed us what it's like to be with Christ. The woman who was caught in the very act of adultery showed us what it was like to be with Christ, right? Because when she was in a misogynistic society, right, and the folks. Uh, brought her, but they didn't bring the man, right, that, that committed these, uh, the, the act of adultery with her. For some reason, she was, uh, uh, she committed adultery alone, but uh, Jesus showed you that he defended her, right, and he spoke uh, against those who uh, would marginalize her, and he said those who would not sin cast the first stone, and so he put them in their place, and he set her free. Uh, come on now, so uh, in any situation we're in, whether we have Skid Row or whether we're at the border, we've got to uh, be Christ to folks, right? Uh, he said, Gee, Paul said, if I live or if I die, if I die, Christ is magnified in my body. Mm-hmm. And so if Christ is magnified, that means we ought to put, be put in a magnifying glass on Christ so that people can see Christ because people are far away from God. And it is through Christ that they see God. So we need to magnify God. That's the way you magnify God. You, yeah. you don't magnify God simply by just raising your hand in a church building. No, you magnify Christ by allowing people to see that Christ cares for them. The people at the border need to see Christ magnified in their lives. Uh, Charlie Africa Canon, who was uh, shot by the police department here in Los Angeles, LAPD, we advocated for Charlie for Charlie Africa for years. And finally, um, his, uh, uh, his parents received a $9 million um, uh, settlement from the city of L.A. because LAPD uh, killed him on Skid Row, uh, and he was an immigrant from Cameroon. So we have to work, and we have to elevate those, and we have to say, yo, people are uh, uh, valuable, right? Uh, because uh, when we show that people are valuable, we're showing that the image of God is, is, is valuable. And so uh, that's the way we magnify God. That's the way we magnify Christ. That's the way we live is Christ. And to die is Cain, because if we die, then we go be with Christ. That's what believers believe. And so that's why we do the work we do. Yeah, and, and the two of us, uh, uh, you know, we come from a tradition where we sing that song, and they will know that we are Christians by mm-hmm. our love. <laughs> you know, so it just yeah. shows the, uh, the power of love. Um, um, that we have to, you know, uh, live into, live up to, and live out uh, as it pertains, you know, to our ministry with the least of these, with uh, those who are vulnerable. There are, there are several intersections, uh, and we cannot miss this. Before we get to some solutions, I think it's so important that we draw the intersections between what's happening, you know, at the border uh, uh, with uh, black people and what's happening in the United States, you know, uh, with black people. In fact, there are historical connections uh, around this. Uh, I will lift up a few, uh, Pastor Q, then I I would like for you to respond to some of that, given the intersectional work that the two of us are engaged in, you know, here locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally as well. Um, You know, the separation of children from their 
uh, uh, parents. Certainly, that is, uh, that is historic in the history of the United States. That took place uh, with our Native American uh, sisters and brothers. Uh, that took place with our African sisters and brothers uh, who uh, were uh, brought over here by way of forced migration um, uh, in terms of what happened to you know, uh, uh, those uh, who experienced you know, uh, slavery, and, and I say experience slavery because that's different than saying they were slaves, you know, uh, in, terms, in terms of this. So they've experienced, you know, uh, slavery. There was some separation taking place, you know, uh, there. That's the same separation, I mean, taking place uh, uh, right now. Uh, a black mother from Honduras uh, is, you know, referenced in the article from the L.A. Progressive, You know, uh, she said she was detained for two months and separated from her child. Uh, She described her horroring experiences uh, in ICE custody in what is known as the, quote, dog kennel and the, quote, walk-in freezer. Uh, So there's a connection between between that. The militarization uh, uh, taking place on the border that uh, so many are experiencing, certainly the militarization of police departments uh, within the United States and the resources, you know, going, you know, uh, to, 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 to that. Uh, the deaths that we, you know, hear of, you know, uh, by way of, um, you know, uh, um, state-sanctioned violence that's taking place on the border, that's happening certainly in so many of our cities, you know, uh, in the United States. And then I lift up, you know, just um, now one more, you know, uh, in terms of the surveillance on the border, Pastor Q. Uh, certainly the two of us know uh, how that connects with the surveillance that's taking place in a lot of our cities in the United States. So this is, you know, uh, uh, really an intersectional challenge that we are dealing with, you know, um, uh, uh, around the, the houselessness on the border, the houselessness in so many cities. Your thoughts on just these, you know, intersectional aspects of what we're dealing with um, and how that, you know, uh, just uh, impacts, you know, uh, how that impacts the life of, of so many people as well as, you know, those who seek to advocate, you know, for uh, racial justice, uh, equity, uh, as we as we look at these, you know, uh, intersectional aspects of the challenges. Well, I mean, I could I could go so many places with this, right? But let us just think about during World War II, when you had uh, so many uh, ex enslaved Africans, right, who were migrating, millions who were migrating from the south escaping Jim Crow laws, when we talk about militarization, right? Escaping Jim Crow laws and the KKK, and usually in the, uh, the books here, the, 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 the high school books, they'll t- history books, they'll tell you because they were trying to find jobs. Yeah, they were trying to find jobs, but they were mainly escaping, you know, the brutality in the South of white mobs, uh, killing black folks and lynching black folks, right? And they ended up here in Los Angeles, and migrated from South Central, and at the same time you have Japanese being interned, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, black folks would migrate down Central Avenue <laughs> from South Central into Little Tokyo, mm-hmm. which eventually became Bronzeville, right? And Bronzeville was black world, Wall Street West to black folks, right? And so because of that, we had a black contingent in Little Tokyo, and when the Japanese came back three years later, the system, right, the folks that run the system, the dominant culture said, okay, well, we don't need you anymore. We don't need your money anymore. The Japanese are back. So you can leave now, and we're not going to renew your lease, and we're not going to renew your your rent for uh, the nightclub, the jazz clubs, who would have originated uh, back then, and the blues clubs, and all of the businesses, and merchants, and banks, and all the other stuff that was here in Little Tokyo. And at the same time, we, you see that, I bring that up because as we talk about militarization and housing, that's a housing issue. They were having a housing crisis at the time mm-hmm. uh, that these folks moved uh, during World War II. And the 70s 
same housing crisis has never been resolved. Mm. And so when people think about Skid Row, they think people on drugs, they think all of this other stuff. But Skid Row is a microcosm of what's going on around the nation. Forty percent of homeless people in America are black. Uh, our, our foster care system, right, a huge foster care system. Uh, at one point, our foster care system was over 500,000 uh, people uh, uh, youths, right? Um, we know Karen Bass. Our congresswoman worked a lot on that, right? And mm-hmm. we still have tons of foster care students. Most of the most of the, the foster care youths are black, and they're the last to be to, to be taken when it comes to you know trying to get a, a foster family or or be adopted or different things like that. So this anti-blackness is rooted in immigration. It's rooted in family separation. It's rooted in homelessness. All of that stuff. So even downtown Los Angeles, where we have such a huge, rich black culture hidden beneath the surface of the apparatus that's called the uh, financial districts and all the other district and gentrification. Biddy Mason and and the first Mm -hmm. African Methodist Episcopal Church started in, in, in downtown Los Angeles, one block from where we have the church with our walls in Skid Row. So all of these things, and you see, even in Skid Row, when the United Nations came to Skid Row two uh, last year and said, "Hey, there's more access to a restrooms in a Syrian refugee camp than we have in Skid Row," mm. right? And now, when you look at all of the stuff that's coming up in the paper and rats and all of this other stuff they're talking about, we're like, "Dude, we've been trying to tell you guys this forever," right? And so now they're in the paper and and folks are scrambling. So when you think about blackness and immigration and policing and the militarization we had it was 80 100 million dollars allocated for several years 100 million dollars allocated for homelessness in skid row 85 percent of it went to the police so not only do we have to demilitarize we have to demilitarize we have to reimagine what public safety is and we have to reimagine public safety through a racial justice line yeah. uh, lens right so mm-hmm. it, and 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 the fact that Charlie Africa, uh, who was who couldn't get back to Cameroon and was trying to get back to Cameroon and ended up on Skid Row, and he ended up being slain by LAPD here right. in Los mm-hmm. Angeles, uh, it tells you um, that the intersectionality between not just African Americans but but the diaspora and the, the problems we're facing. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and certainly regarding you know uh, Charlie Africa, it was a. Uh, um, um, I'm grateful for uh, how we all came together, you know, uh, mm-hmm. as a faith community uh, to make a statement saying that, you know, uh, we will make sure that Charlie Africa receives uh, the funeral that he deserves. And, and it was an honor uh, for me uh, as the senior pastor at Home United Methodist Church uh, to make that entire campus available um, for uh, uh, the celebration of his life. Uh, we welcomed several of his friends from Skid Row. His family uh, came from the East Coast, and um, and certainly, you know, his family received that settlement. But but even with all of that, it is all about you know it was all about his humanity and his dignity, you know, uh, uh, because because of the diversity, you know, even within black uh, uh, homelessness uh, right there in you know in in, in Skid Row. Uh, the, the the piece that you just mentioned is very very important. Um, you know, around how do we build a bridge between resisting, you know, um, um, uh, that which is bad, uh, and reimagine uh, something good. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that there will always be creative tension, you know, uh, uh, between that, um, and and certainly we we continue to resist and to reimagine, and and and, and those that's where some of these solutions, you know, are, are coming in. Um, so before we, you know, get to that, uh, because in this article from the L.A., you know, Progressive, the, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, and just by the way, they will join us, you know, for our next, you know, show uh, that, will be, uh, that will take place on August the 25th. You know, uh, we've, 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 we've uh, connected and, and, and confirmed that we'll have somebody here from the Black Alliance uh, as well as from, from several other, you know, other organizations that's, that's working around this. Uh, um, one cannot, you know, as we try to reimagine what needs to happen, we have to acknowledge, you know, um, who's there and what's there, 
and this article, of course, points out, you know, uh, that, you know, we have about 3,000 migrants, you know, uh, that got to the, um, uh, the Mexican border in, in, in 2018. Uh, and this year alone, uh, 2,000 to date. The countries that they are coming from, Cameroon, Congo, and Angola, you know, these are uh, chief countries, you know, uh, that they uh, come from. Um, uh, and then, of course, um, we, uh, Charlie Africa was Cameroonian, by the way. Uh, so, 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 again, as I mentioned, these countries, you know, one has to look and see what's happening in those countries, but not just that, but we also have to look at U.S. foreign policy, you know, mm-hmm. uh, towards those uh, particular countries. You know, um, uh, one cannot, you know, miss that. And then, you know, regarding refugees from Central America, you know, uh, uh, Baji notes, you know, in the article, you know, that 70,000 accompanied minors cross, uh, uh, cross the U.S.-Mexico border fleeing environmental harm, oppressive governmental regimes sponsored by the U.S., uh, the uh, transnational war on drugs, drugs, and a number of other life-threatening conflicts, you know, uh, that takes place there. In addition to uh, Haitian, you know, uh, sisters and brothers there, uh, it is also believed that many of the migrants are members of the Afro-Indigenous Garifuna people. Uh, these are now folk from, uh, you know, uh, countries such as Belize, uh, but uh, but Garifuna is an indigenous group, so so they you know span over several you know uh, countries uh, in terms of that uh, they have struggled you know with land grabs, drug trafficking, and environmental uh, devastation. So one cannot overlook the root cause of some of this, which is of course the U.S. you know a destructive and exploitive. Um, tentacles around uh, economic policies uh, towards uh, these countries, both on the continent as well as you know uh, in, in 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 South America. So so that's very very important for us to you know to look at. So so as we transition to uh, resolutions or solutions, you know it is it is key for us who who are here in the United States to get to know and understand what these policies are, how the Trump administration uh, continues to adjust these policies, you know, um, uh, around what's happening in these countries and how, you know, we who are here have to know and understand uh, the, the intersection between U.S. foreign policy to countries of color and U.S. domestic policies towards communities of color you know, in the United States, and to see how we really, you know, uh, have to look at this from what I call a global perspective, you know, uh, bring together what's happening globally and what's happening locally. After all, you know, uh, borders, you know, um, uh, sometimes can be very, very, you know, artificial uh, in terms of how it's, it's, it's enforced and how it's utilized. So, Pastor Q, in light of all of that, you know, what are some of the solutions that, uh, that you're looking at, uh, that you can recommend, um, some we've already worked on, uh, but your thoughts on just some solutions, and I want to share what Budgie, you know, uh, shares, and then we want to talk about some of our upcoming trips, you know, uh, to Tijuana uh, that, um, that we are involved in. So your thoughts on some of the solutions, you know, to this uh, complicated, comprehensive, multidimensional challenge that we are facing on the border. Yes, uh I think one of the solutions is we have to educate our people, right, our people who are here, um, because obviously um, there are, you and I know, th- know this, there aren't a whole lot of black folks flooding to the border to try to assist our folks. We've got the, the few groups, you know, with Baji and Hagen Bridge Alliance and our group, uh, and we're grateful for that. You've got a whole lot more. Um, people fleeing to the border to assist um, folks uh, who are brown, but folks who are black don't have to get that. Uh, secondly, I think in order to deal with what you're saying, we have to be able to deal, if, if America cannot deal or with, with black people here, black lives doesn't matter here in Los Angeles, here in, uh, in the United States, um, how will they have a different uh, 
policy, a foreign policy perspective, right? Um, they're going to deal with um, countries of color and uh, in different regions of the world the same way they deal with us, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Uh, and when we say our lives matter, they'll say no, all lives matter, right? To, to, <laughs> to try to minimize uh, the fact that they are targeting a certain group of people with systemic racism, the Jim Crow <laughs> criminal justice system, uh, police killing <laughs> black folks just for no reason. And so um, they're dealing with those countries in the same way. And that is why you hear uh, the, the, the president who emerged out of this movement. He didn't start the movement, by the way. He emerged out of it. That's why he's the mouthpiece, and he's saying what those people have been feeling uh, forever. That's why he could call those countries s countries and different mm-hmm, things like mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. So uh, we have work to do to advocate to change those things here um, on the ground. And as we change them locally, we're noticing that uh, things are beginning to change nationally, right? That whole the Congress passed fifteen dollars an hour. Well, you know we've been working on that forever. <laughs> oh yeah, right? we've been here in Los Angeles, passed it for the hotel workers several years ago with uh, our partnership with Unite here and, and and other unions. And finally, Congress passed at fifteen dollars an hour, and we know that ooh, ooh, that's a short celebration because <laughs> the minimum wage, in order to be able to get housing affordability, should be. You know, in the 30s and 40 dollars an hour. So, you know, so uh, we're still behind the eight ball trying to uh, do this kind of stuff. Uh, and then, of course, the trips that we have planned. We have two trips planned: one uh, on August 3rd, heading back to uh, Tijuana. Mm-hmm. One on August 3rd, um, with um, mainly clergy and community groups. We are also going on August uh, 17th with St. John's. Um, Health uh, care um, nonprofit here in Los Angeles, and we uh, are going with their mobile clinic to do um, just um, you know try to take care of some of the folks who are out there at the border. We'll also be meeting with uh, the, the Haitian folks that are at that church that we went to, and we right. hope to make a trip to um, Little Haiti. Um, there's a community <laughs> Little Haiti Little in Haiti. Tijuana. <laughs> In Tijuana, right? Right, right, right. So we plan on making that trip there. So part of it is, is engaging the people and finding out what they want and um, what they need in order to survive. Uh, we've talked about several things um, in terms of how do we help uh, economically to create an economic base for our people because several of those people are working as well. There, A lot of people are working yeah. there in uh, Tijuana, and they're not just idle. They're trying to make do with whatever they have so uh, that's some of the things Mm -hmm. uh, we're working on in terms of immigration and also with the black and brown working hard to build relationship between black and brown um, Mm -hmm. and to elevate um, the issue of immigration uh, give people the true perspective not Mm -hmm. it's not just you know a brown issue Mm -hmm. Um, that's what the administration is doing to divide us it's really Mm -hmm. black brown and everybody right we ain't even talked about we haven't even talked about the 600,000 white immigrants uh, who are here uh, undocumented right (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah Yeah, certainly I mean in the midst of this politics of 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 deception uh, as well as uh, uh, politics of fear uh, and how that relates to, you know, really challenging uh, all of us to make sure that we really not just keep up on our own problems uh, uh, and, and, and isolate us from others, but to really look at the connection between all of these challenges. Uh, and, and because not making the connection can result into breaking. And, uh, and bridging is so key, you know, uh, seeing that uh, all of these challenges connect you know, in in, in so many different ways. I want to lift up, you know, uh, some of the solutions that that the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. is offering, you know, in this article. uh, Budget believes a holistic approach is required to support black refugees uh, and the advocates at the border. Examples of what is needed include funding for black uh, immigration and refugee organizations, facilitating black leadership at the border, uh, mm-hmm. ensuring that larger board organizations serve black immigrants, yes. uh, African language and Creole interpreters, and culturally competent lawyers, 
you know, uh, to kind of be present, you know, uh, there as we, uh, as we look at, you know, this, uh, this opportunity, you know, for us. And then, of course, um, um, the article ends, you know, with the words, Pastor Q, that, that we so often utter, and that is, Black Lives Matter at the border. And, and so and so that's that's critical. Uh, as I've mentioned, this is the first of several, you know, opportunities we're going to be, you know, looking at this. Uh, the next time we're going to be um, uh, checking in on this again on um, August the twenty fifth. You know, uh, where we'll have several folk, you know, uh, here with us. I know Pastor Q. You know, uh, we'll certainly have you if you're available. You know, uh, uh, to join us, you know, for for this uh, opportunity, I want to just mention then on on uh, another program note on August the eighteenth, uh, we're going to be looking at what's going on in uh, Puerto Rico. So we're going to be having uh, some of our sisters and brothers right here from Los Angeles, as well as uh, from Puerto Rico, join us around what's happening there and what's going on, you know, uh, around uh, Puerto Rico and. You know, uh, uh, its history of colonization by the United States, uh, mm-hmm. and to see how we can continue to march towards a uh, more just and fair Puerto Rico. So that's going to be in August um, the 11th. You know that we're going to be looking, you know, at that uh, piece. Pastor Q, before we leave, uh, mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about what's coming up. You know, uh, uh, for us, with us, you know, uh, in uh, Skid Row as we seek to connect. You know, uh, 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 advocacy with, you know, uh, social uh, entrepreneurship uh, around making sure that we uh, that we begin to generate, you know, our own resources to fund the struggle that we engaged in uh, around uh, Skid Row, uh, which again is is part of what you know Budgie is um, recommending around what's happening with. You know, uh, uh, immigrant or black immigrant organizations. You know, as we deal with happening at the border. So, so just kind of let us know what's coming up, and we're certainly looking forward to to being down there and joining that conscious party. Yes. Well, we are having uh, on. We are actually launching a organization, social entrepreneurship organization, a social enterprise, like you call it. Uh, uh, it's called the Hip Hop Smoothie Shop. And um, we are having our fundraiser on August 24th from 4 to 8 p.m. And the Hip Hop Smoothie Shop, one of the, each smoothie has a theme. So we have uh, Sugar Hill, uh, which is one of the first hip hop records. But Sugar Hill also speaks of a community here in Los Angeles uh, that used to be called Sugar Hill. And Hattie McDaniels was the first black person to win an Oscar for the stereotypical role. Um, of a maid in the European-American classic Gone with the Wind. Uh, she used to live in that community. You know, there was redlining going on in that community, right? And uh, the white residents had sued the black residents in that community to try to get the black folks out. But the black folks won that lawsuit, and what the black folks uh, could not do, I mean, what the white folks could not do with the law, uh, the Department of Transportation did it with the uh, Santa Monica Freeway, the 10 Freeway. And that community today is called West Adams. It's where you used to pastor. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we make connections like that. Even with our, the Bronzeville smoothie speaks of Little Tokyo and the relationship between black folks and, uh, and Japanese. And the smoothie has peanut butter for George Washington Carver and all of his work. And it also has a Japanese matcha sp- sprinkle on the top of it. Uh, and we <laughs> can have a smoothie and talk about... Um, just the relationship and watch how systems divide people, right? Because had it not been for Jim Crow laws and redlining and all of that and, and, and a housing shortage, we would not have any tension between Japanese and, and black folks at that time. So the system continues to put us against each other by, 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 by marginalizing us, uh, marginalizing the Japanese and put them in internment camp. And at the same time, you have another group of people fleeing Jim, Jim Crow laws and oppression in the South. So the, uh, the smoothie lifts that up. And another important thing about the smoothie, uh, the hip hop smoothie shop, uh, is that we are using hip hop. I was a, an, an ex Virgin Records art, artist. I used to be a hip hop artist being signed to Virgin Records. Uh, but with everybody from Tupac, you name it, DJ Quick, everybody. And so uh, that's why we use hip-hop, because hip-hop is something that we created. It comes out of the diaspora, just mm-hmm. like jazz came out of the diaspora. Mm-hmm. And most people don't know downtown L.A. between 5th, 
First and Fifth Street on Central Avenue is where jazz emerged because of the Africans who were fleeing uh, the South and moving to the West. That's where jazz and blues emerged right there on between First and Fifth Street. So on the um, on the uh, on the artist list for that night, we're going to have jazz artists. We have a young lady who's Egyptian and Chilean. Uh, her her um, stepfather is the legendary jazz bassist Stanley Clark. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we are. She's going to be on the on the roster for that night, and we're going to have different folks who are on the roster for that night. Um, and we're using smoothie tonight to, to to bring all types of help to our community, economic health, um, physical health. Uh, and for us in Skid Row, it's important because people always talk about we have a lot of drug dealers in Skid Row and different things like that. We're trying to see if we can uh, create a different type of economics in Skid Row to motivate our people to uh, choose businesses that elevate and, and create health in our community rather than destruction in our community. It's one thing to tell people not to do something. It's something else to give them the opportunity to see something better and to motivate them and inspire them to move to something better. So that's uh, going to happen. You'll be hearing about the Hip Hop Smoothie Shop um, uh, as it gets nearer and nearer, but um, August 24th from 4 to 8 p.m. Uh, at LA Can Los Angeles Community Action Network at 838 East 6th Street down in Los Angeles. L.A. Can is doing a lot of great work, a lot of great advocacy work around the homeless folk down Mm -hmm. there. So we're partnering with L.A. Can and Skid Row Coffee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 just just a whole whole bunch of love. Yes, 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 yes. Look, we cannot overlook the fact that, you know, uh, the, the structural and the institutional you know, uh, schemes and systems that continue yeah. to perpetuate anti-blackness mm. and white supremacy. It's mm. economic, you yeah. know, uh, and so, so, so we are really uh, trying to see how we can weaponize our advocacy work with economics, yes, you know, exactly. as we as we seek to work towards uh, our um, our liberation. We have to make you know let folk know. I mean, uh, uh, LA Can right there in Skid Row. Uh, what's happening on the roof at LA Can? Quickly, mm. uh, I believe we have a community garden there. Yes. And, uh, uh, and every Thursday we have a day, there is a farmer's market. Farmer's uh, market. So, yeah. so it's going down. We got Skid Row Coffee. I mean, I'm telling you, you know, so, so I mean, that's just, you know, uh, 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 your leadership as the QEs is uh, always reminding us of um, what we ought to own. Uh, what we ought to do on an ongoing basis, uh, that is to be on the front lines, to, to have our faith on the front lines and transform faith or religion so many times used as a tool for discrimination, exploitation, and dehumanization to flip the script on that and say, no, you know, uh, the faith that we are called to uh, profess and to apply, you know, uh, is a faith uh, that is about liberation and transformation. It's about love, not hatred. You know, uh, it's about, you know, uh, celebrating the humanity of people, not stripping people from the humanity. Essentially, it invites us to see how this bridge between resistance and reimagination is a bridge uh, mm-hmm. that, uh, that we can continue to elevate by way of how we uh, advocate for it, but also how we then you know, uh, facilitate the necessary economic support for it you know, uh, in moving you know, forward. Uh, with yes, it. yes, yes, yes. Uh, because uh, black, because black capitalism will not save us. We've got to come up with our own model. We have to reimagine that as well. Decolonize our um, economics. As yeah, well. Deconstruction for the sake yeah. of reconstruction. You know, yeah, as yeah. we as we as we move forward. Pastor Q, uh, I'm looking forward to the 24th. Uh, it's going to be the Saturday before we're going to be doing. You know, uh, 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 part two of our. Uh, uh, thought-provoking, solutions-oriented, you know, dialogue around uh, blacks on the border, and so yeah. I'm looking forward to some awesome uh, uh, smoothies and to uh, yeah. and to connect with our folk and, and uh, in the road. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes. So, listen. Thanks for joining, man. I know uh, this has been a busy day for you, but glad you made the time uh, to join the conversation. As always, it's been value added. I love you, man, and appreciate you. And looking forward to our ongoing work uh, together as we uh, work towards a more just and fair society. Love you, brother. Well, thank you, my brother. Thanks for having me, and thanks for the audience to the audience for listening to us. Uh, um, blessings to all.
Yes. We're going to close out our time together um, uh, by uh, uh, doing some Sankofa, you know, as we uh, call on the uh, spirit of James Baldwin uh, to once again enlighten us and encourage us during these uh, turbulent uh, times. Uh, James Baldwin wrote the following words. Uh, This is one of my favorite quotes uh, from uh, Brother Baldwin. It is certain in any case that ignorance allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. We see this emanating right now uh, from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue as the occupant of the people's house, you know, uh, certainly uh, 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 is uh, doing whatever uh, he can uh, to, um, uh, to be that ferocious enemy uh, that we uh, can have. But we stand on the shoulders of James Baldwin. We stand on the shoulders of so many of our other warriors that, uh, that, uh, that has gone before us. And we uh, uh, exclaim uh, loudly, we exclaim proudly uh, that uh, we will overcome. This has been Faith Without Borders. So glad that you're able to join us once again uh, uh, to uh, do some thought-provoking and solutions-oriented dialogue uh, with folk while on the front lines. And we're looking forward to you joining us again uh, the next time uh, that we'll be on. will be on Sunday, uh, August the uh, 11th at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we're going to be talking about uh, uh, what's happening in Puerto Rico Uh, and continue to do our work together. Thank you so much. Let's continue to uh, uh, move forward, uh, move onward, uh, and uh, do what it is that we can do to make sure that humanity and dignity is restored to everybody.